The Old Testament reading for the 15th Sunday after Trinity is from 1 Kings chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Continue with the gradual together. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The epistle is from Galatians chapters 5 and 6. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, 
which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Luther wrote the small catechism in 1529, almost 500 years ago. We should probably start getting ready to celebrate that anniversary of the Reformation, too. But for almost 500 years now, the small catechism of Luther has stood the test of time, and it's the most widely used and printed catechism in the history of the church. The 21st century Lutheran church continues to have the youth of the church commit the six chief parts of Christian doctrine to memory. They learn by heart what the main teachings of the scriptures are. And when someone learns something, and that can be anything, by heart, it becomes a part of who they are. And the longer they use it, the more they study it, the more it gets reinforced in their memory. And the more it shapes their thoughts, their words, and their very lives. But this isn't true of the Catechism because of Luther's genius, but because the truth of Holy Scripture that is summarized in those six chief parts. Even daily prayers are learned by heart because we use them every day. Christian questions with their answers continue to be an invaluable resource before confession and the reception of the Lord's Supper. Christian questions with their answers might not be committed to memory, they might not be learned by heart, but there's still great value in utilizing those questions and answers every week. But there's one other section of the Catechism that I haven't mentioned yet. Can anyone guess what it is? The Table of Duties. It's rarely, if ever, learned by heart. And this section of the small catechism is probably the most useful, along with the Ten Commandments, for daily living. And what's more, the table of duties is all scripture. What does God say specifically to these different positions, these stations in life? What does God say to pastors, to hearers? What does God say to the government? to citizens, to husbands, wives, parents, children, workers, employees, youth, widows, and all people. But it's just Bible passages. So what? It's not like I haven't read it before. You ever said that to yourself? Well, I've read it. I know everything there is now. I'm an expert in it, really. You're an expert after you read something once? That's a pretty incredible claim. But that's really just the voice of laziness and sloth. Because we think reading something once is enough. Throughout the six chief parts of the Catechism, the question is asked, where is this written? Where does God say this in his word? But in the table of duties... The question isn't even asked, where is this written? Because the table of duties answers without being asked. This is what God says. This is what he says to pastors. This is what he says to those who hear preaching. Think of our Old Testament lesson. We hear of 
the prophet Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. It's a great story. The preacher Elijah is sent from God to meet this widow, and he tells her, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Remember, they're in a drought, and a very severe drought at that. But she goes to bring it. And as she's going, the preacher says, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But what does this woman, this widow, what does she have to offer the preacher? All she has left is a little oil and a little flour, enough to make one small meal for her and her son. And after they eat it, they'll wait to die. But the preacher gives her something even greater than a drink of water and a morsel of bread. The preacher comes and gives the promise of God that in this instance, the oil and the flour won't run out until after this drought ends and it rains again. And so we see this widow go off to bring that morsel of bread. It almost sounds like the widow in the temple who gave two copper pennies. She gave out of her poverty all that she had. The widow of Zarephath hears the preacher. And she believes in the promise of God that he speaks. And she acts. And she provides for the preacher. And then she has no lack because of the promise of God. She's got worries and concerns that don't even compare to the worries and concerns that we have. But the promise of God is given to her, and she trusts in him. And God provides. Now back to the table of duties about preachers and hearers, like we saw in that Old Testament lesson. The preacher Elijah and the hearer, the widow of Zarephath. Scripture says in the table of duties, amongst other passages, Titus 1 verse 9. This is about preachers. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Preachers are to cling firmly to the trustworthy message taught by the prophets and the apostles to do what? To proclaim it to you, to encourage you, to build you up in the faith, to show you your sins that you would repent and to give you the forgiveness of Christ and his cross. And how? With sound doctrine, right teaching, from God's word. And what about you? You who hear preaching. What does God say? 1 Thessalonians 5.12 We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. How do you respect those who labor among you? who are over you in the Lord and admonish you to hear, to listen, to pay attention to preaching. And in order to do that, we have to get away with our distractions. Everything that's floating around in your mind this morning. And that big distraction, we all know about it because Almost everyone here has it. It's probably in your pocket. And if it's not, and it's in your hand, then you know all the more, because you want to take that glowing little box and to stare into, mes into that mesmerizing glow and lose yourself in everything around you. And when that little box buzzes or beeps or chirps or rings, it sends a rush of excitement. You get a hit of dopamine in your brain. 
And it happens so often for us that we've become numb to it. We don't even notice how excited we are. And maybe some of you are on it right now, or maybe 10 seconds ago you were. And up until now, you've hardly heard a single word that I've said. That's a distraction, and we all have distractions. Even preachers have distractions that draw us away from what truly matters. And we might not be concerned about what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear. But we sure are worried and distracted by a lot of other things. So put your phone away right now in this place. Put it on airplane mode. Turn it completely off if you have to. Because there's still going to be other things that distract you that are less easy to control. Maybe you're concerned about what you're going to have for Sunday dinner today. Well, that problem, that concern, that worry, it's still going to be there when you leave. Maybe you're concerned about paying the mortgage, getting the kids new shoes again, fixing that broken furnace because you almost froze to death last night. You gotta go back to school tomorrow. You gotta go back to work tomorrow. Whatever concerns and worries you have in life, they're still gonna be there. Jesus says sufficient for the day is its own trouble. But for now, for right now, what does the preacher whom God has sent to you, what does he come to give you? The promise of God. It's not about the oil and the flour in your kitchen, because wouldn't that be nice? Not that promise. The promise of God who provides all that you need to support this body and life that you can't have two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Because which one's going to give you more concern? Which one's going to give you more worries, God or money? The ESV translates that word anxiety. And for us, it conjures up ideas of mental health, and therapy, clinical diagnosis, medications. And those things are there. And they're important to address them. But is that what Jesus is getting at? It's better understood of concerns or worries that are common to all people. But God knows what you need. Remember, God created and cared for the flowers of the field before he created man, and he still preserves his creation. He still takes care of it. But God in Christ became man. Jesus didn't become a flower. He didn't come to redeem flowers. But he became man to redeem man. He took on human flesh and he lived among men. And Jesus knows what it is to be without. Jesus was hungry. He was thirsty. He cried. He slept. He was tempted in the wilderness just as you are. And yet, he was without sin. He loved his Father with all his heart, soul, mind, and heart, and his neighbor as himself. He served and obeyed his Father's will and laid down his life for you on the cross. He wasn't distracted. He wasn't deterred. He didn't serve idols or cons was consumed by worry about food and clothing 
For scripture says he had no place to lay his head. But he served his father alone. It's the pagans of the world, the unbelievers of the world, who seek after wealth, power, and comfort. But you, Christian, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, your food, your clothing, your drink, all of it. These things will be added to you. For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So if you still have your phone out, put that thing away. And do your best to get rid of the distractions around you in this place, in this moment. And seek what is right in front of you. What is going to be held up in, before your eyes in a few moments? The body and blood of your God. The body and blood of Jesus given and shed for you. The peace that he gives you as you eat and drink. And when you go back to the concerns of today, you can face them with the confidence that the preacher of God has come to give you divine and holy promises. For by those promises, God gladdens your soul. For he listens to your plea. God provides you out of his abundant grace and mercy. He gives you his only begotten son and all the benefits that he won by, the, by his cross and resurrection. And he gives it to you freely through faith alone. Your life, your salvation, your righteousness, it's in Jesus. Worrying about th the things of this life won't add a single moment to your life. But seek first his kingdom. For the kingdom of God comes indeed without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. It's right here in front of you. It's right here as the word of God is preached into your ears that bespeaks you righteous for the sake and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who is risen from the dead. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.